morning, good morning. I'm going to get straight into this because I am, uh, as per usual, have too much content to try and share in such a short period of time. So um, I must apologise in advance. My slides are very text heavy, but I've done that on purpose so that you can actually go back and have a look at them. So first of all, I'd just like to outline how powerful media is on influencing human behaviour, feelings, attitudes, perspectives and beliefs. Uh, television viewers of high crime series have a greater <coughs> sensitivity and a greater fear to uh, crime in general. And viewers of medical based series have a greater faith in doctors. So this is the sort of impact that or uh, influence it has on adult beliefs. So it also has this, this type of influence on children. So television influences people's perceptions of social reality because they construct knowledge from what they're exposed to. Can you hear this okay? You can. No? A little bit. Maybe close the door. Is that better? I'll just lean in more. Okay. Okay, so it's no secret that um, media has become more sexualised. Um, it's become ever-present and have become more frequent and more extreme. The explicitness and frequency of sexual connotation in contemporary music media in particular, because that's the area that I had to look into quite deeply, has increased dramatically. And we know that media and marketing play a significant role in shaping and normalising sexualised presentation. And many depictions in media promote unhealthy sexual behaviour or represent <coughs> traditional soft porn pornography, particularly in the music industry. So here's a little bit of an example of what we're seeing in media. In 2013, I did a study, a content analysis on music videos. The unique thing about that study was I um, didn't study the top 100 or the top 20. I actually studied music videos available to children or available to the public on PG and G-rated television. Of these videos, 55% of them contained sexualised content. Um, children also nominated uh, music videos uh, from a different study that I did with children. <coughs> I asked them what their preference um, in music was. They nominated music videos, the ones that I had not already analysed through the PG and G-rated television programs. I uh, went and reviewed separately and 77% of those contained sexualised content. The highest scoring genres were R&B, hip hop, dance and pop genres. Um, and these were also children's preferred genres. The most sexualised codes were lyrics, dress and non-dance movements. Uh, in 2013, the highest scoring artists were Beyonce, Katy Perry, Lady Gaga and Miley Cyrus. They had several um, depictions of sexualised content, but also the duration of the music video was quite high in sexualised content as well. Here's some of the examples of um, the images that, ch that children are being exposed to in music media on PG and G-rated television. As you can see, we've got uh, sex-inspired body stockings, dominatrix doc uh, costumes and bondage-type apparatus, nakedness, and Katy Perry has a tendency to um, integrate cutesy and erotica. This is a problem because Australian children engage quite a lot with media. Um, the latest research, which is quite old now, 2006, uh, 2010, um, found that Children aged 8 to 17 year olds engage with media 4 hours and 49 minutes per day on average. They're starting to embrace new technologies, so they're not just watching TV, they're um, engaging with media on iPhones, iPads, internet, etc. There's a rise in technology ownership. Children from 8 years of age uh, commonly have their own mobile phones now. And because I looked at music media, I looked at um, children's engagement with music media specifically, and 18% of five to eight year olds and 43% of nine to 11 year olds uh, are downloading music media from the internet. So as we know, um, the internet is very difficult 
to regulate and has very limited classifications. I interviewed children, oh, 103 children singularly, so 51 year grade ones and, and <coughs> 52 year fours, to find out what um, music media they engage with. So I asked them questions around who's their favourite music artists, what's their favourite music video, and who they think are the most popular male and female music artists. 52% of children preferred sexualised music videos and artists. So they, their favourite artist um, displayed some sort of sexual connotation. And 62% identified artists who displayed some level of sexual signification as the most popular. So they're recognising that um, the most popular music artists are the ones that present more sexually, or they may not be noticing that, but um, it might be that they are more popular because they're uh, presenting sexually. Another study I did was an experimental study where I interviewed children about their um, ideas of gender, their, their um, self-presentation, their expectations of other gender and the way they think their own and opposite gender behave. I then went back to the um, schools and um, did an experimental and a control group, exposed one group to um, sexualised music videos in saying that to get through ethics, they were very, very mild, um, and a control group where there was uh, music videos that had no sexual content in there whatsoever. I discovered that a one-off exposure to music video had no impact on their attitudes or self-presentation, probably because they're exposed to that on a daily basis anyway. Um, they also had an uh, activity of dressing dolls where they had um, a variety of clothing that was sexualised and non-sexualised. 78% uh, of children dress their female music artists sexually. They were asked to dress a um, doll in as a female singer and a doll as a male singer. They were also asked to dress a doll in clothes that they prefer and then clothes that they prefer for their own and opposite gender. So, yes, yeah, 78% <coughs> dress their female music artists sexually as opposed to 30% when dressing their male artists. 50% of girls in both cohorts, so that's grade ones and grade fours, showed a preference for sexually signified clothing. This was prior to the exposure to any sort of music videos because um, <coughs> when I looked at their exposure, or their pre-exposure and post-exposure, there wasn't much difference. But it did demonstrate that 50% of girls did have a preference for sexually signified clothing before any sort of exposure and 23% of boys. 51% um, of children preferred sexu sexy clothing for girls. So when they were asked, what um, clothing do you like girls to wear? 51% uh, chose the more sexualized costumes as opposed to 37% for boys. And when asked questions around why they chose these particular costumes, uh, it was always based on appearance. And they were, were using language such as because it looks hot, because it looks sexy, because it looks cool. A further study I did is observe children in a school disco context. So I basically went to the, attended the school discos, marked off children's um, clothing choices based on a, a rigid um, pro forma that I adopted from Baxter um, to identify whether children were dressed sexually or non-sexually. Some of the um, sexualised demonstrations were things like low cut tops, heavy makeup, um, micro mini shorts or skirts, um, tank tops with very low gaping sides, etc. So I observed uh, 366 children overall, and you can see the breakdown of their age groups. Um, 119 children were further observed if they displayed some sort of sexualised behaviour. So if they were dancing sexually or um, engaging in flirting behaviours, um, self-stroking, that type of thing. 27% um, of children dressed in a way that signified adult sexuality, so it's 99 children. <laughs> and 33% engaged in sexually signified conduct, so dance and flirtatious behaviours. Uh, an example of that was um, an F2 foundation to two girls, so around about aged five to eight, 
was wearing a mini skirt, t-shirt and wearing makeup. Her movements included rotating hips and shoulders and thrusting her crotch and pouting her lips. And a F2 boy had the hands on the back of his head, sort of crutching his, um, thrusting his crutch forward, very much like you see in music videos. In the upper levels, had four year three to seven girls dancing too low by flow riders. So they were all sort of crouching down seductively, running their hands slowly up and down their thighs, rotating shoulders, etc. And I'll let you just have a quick read of um, the clothing that they were wearing rather than me actually read it out to you. And a year, uh, three to seven boys, his movements included sort of <coughs> spreading his legs apart in a crouching position whilst dancing up and down and thrusting his hips forward and then thrusting his, his crotch vigorously once. So you, they're, they're very common um, dance and movement behaviours that you see in music, contemporary music videos. Um, there was also evidence, and obviously when we're observing children, we can't say, we can't claim that that's direct evidence of them imitating music artists, even though they are um, copying the types of behaviours and dance movements that music artists um, portray. However, <laughs> there was some clear evidence that they were copying. Obviously, when um, children, the, the song Single Ladies came on, children were doing the hand movements like um, Beyonce. Um, the Sexy and I Know It, now, um, children, uh, that, that uh, basically pulled up uh, all the children in both of the di school disco contexts. They all were very familiar with that song and were dancing uh, the same way that the artists do, particularly in crutching their, um, sorry, thrusting their crutch forward when they were doing the wiggle 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 <coughs> part. Um, even though they had no access to the visual at the school kit, uh, disco, so uh, clearly demonstrates that they have seen the music video and that they are imitating it. Um, why is this a problem? Because of the impact of sexualised media on adolescents and young people. So there's limited studies on younger children because you can't, you can't get this sort of thing through ethics. Um, but it, there's uh, some studies on adolescents and young people. So it demonstrates that um, Adolescents and young people who engage with sexualised media. So th this is a, an array of sexualised music videos, uh, sexualised programs and pornography. It all has the same effect. So when we look at sexualised media, we often think about <coughs> pornography. Um, but the evi there's evidence out there that suggests that sexualised media has just equally as um, big an impact as pornography. So they're engaging in early sexual activity and sexual cohesion. Uh, they're viewing sex as a form of entertainment, so sexual transition uh, where sexual gratification is the only tie. There, there's no emotional ties. It's impacting on their body uh, satisfaction and they're starting to develop dysfunctional attitudes towards women. So sexual exploitation and desensitisation to sexual violence and enacting porn scripts. Now, an, another finding in my uh, second study, when I was discussing with children about gender role and self-identity and what they thought about other genders, one of the questions I asked them was, um, when girls and boys play together, who's in charge of the game? And the majority of them said boys. And they were quite okay with that. That was an expectation that boys were in charge of the game. When I asked them who should be in charge, I was quite surprised um, I expected boys to think that they should be in, in charge. I was quite surprised to learn that girls also thought that boys should be in charge. So as you can see, um, children are starting to already develop um, dysfunctional attitudes around females. Ooh. Why is this happening? Well, one of the reasons is um, <coughs> how vague our television regulations are. Um, commercial television has a co-regulatory system, so it's um, partly regulated through ACMA, so that's the Australian um, Communications Media Authority, but most are regulated by the Commercial Television Industry Code of Practice. So our uh, media industries are largely self-regulated. 
Um, I'm, I've got all, a, a summary of all of the general classifications, which I don't want to uh, bore you by reading out, so I'll let you have a quick read of that. Um, I, like I said before, the reason it's so text heavy is so you can go back and look at it. We done? Yep. Okay, so some of the questions that I pose is what is very mild in impact? What does that mean? These um, classifications have written, have written so vague um, and they're open to interpretation. There is no operational definitions for what these, this language means. So it makes it very difficult when you're trying to lodge a complaint. What does restrained, brief, and very little detail mean? <coughs> Thank you. Mild, coarse language. How can you have mild, coarse language? <laughs> and justified by the storyline or program context. That's one of my favourites. Um, you can justify anything by the um, storyline or program context. So that's our G um, rated. This is our PG. So our PG, very similar to our G rated, but with a little bit more um, flexibility. May contain adult themes. So if you have a look at um, some of the content that they're allowed to show in parental guidance um, recommended television, there's, there is um, a, quite a challenge for parents. Suicide permitted but not promoted. That's, I don't, I'm not quite sure what they're meaning by that. Should be handled carefully. So this is your... Uh, Social and domestic conflict and psychological themes should be handled carefully. <coughs> Our rated M theme, as you can see, because it's um, aimed at people aged 15 years and, and over, there's a lot more flexibility there to, uh, for adult themes. Recommended for viewing, not essential, not uh, needs to be. It's only a recommendation. So um, you can let children four years of age look at that if you want to. It's only a recommendation. Moderate, higher than mild, but lower than strong. Seems though we don't know what mild is or strong. We can't really gauge moderate either. Violence can be realistic, but not detailed. How do you make violence realistic, but not detailed? Suicide's not allowed to be instructional. So you're not allowed to have written instructions on how to suicide. I don't know how you're going to portray suicide without the viewer working out how you've actually done that. You're allowed to have intense adult themes. What are intense adult themes? Now we've got our M15 plus. They're suitable for people aged 15 plus because of the intensity and frequency of violent sexual depiction or coarse language, adult themes or drug use. The impact may be strong. So I don't know how they're measuring the impact and how do you prove that um, a particular program or um, scenario impacted your child. Um, your violence may be detailed but not unduly bloody or horrific. So that have a strong impact. Language is not allowed to be overly impactful. 
I don't understand what that means either. Non-consensual sex, so rape, must not be re represented as desirable. Now, the, some of the concerns around um, the vagueness and of our classifications, our current <laughs> codes and regulations in media, is when when this material is allowed to be on. So you've got your uh, PG and G rated, can be broadcast at any time. When you have a look at some of the um, language used and how open to interpretation it is, it can make it actually very difficult to argue any type of complaint. Um, because it, I've, I've actually done it. I saw a music video that I thought looked like um, a strip club, lap dancing. I wrote a complaint, somebody viewed it, and decided that there was nothing wrong with it. They didn't interpret it as um, lap dancing, even though there was actually a woman dancing on somebody's lap and then a bucket of water over her. Um, and they just dismissed the complaint, saying that it was well within the codes of regulation. And again, that was on PG-rated television. Um, it's quite concerning when you consider some of the adult themes in M and N15+, Plus that these are allowed to be viewed or broadcast from 7.30 and then 8.30 p.m. So this means that all young children, or even children who's uh, too young, too develop developmentally immature to be able to interpret some of the themes and material that they're going to be exposed to. So they're either going to be in bed by 8.30 or parents aren't going, aren't going to expose them to that sort of material. Given that 8.30 is um, the limit or that M uh, MA15 plus material can be broadcast, that's also in relation to advertising as well. So we're getting, even if you are trying to watch a, a PG rated program, you can have MA15 plus material being broadcast in advertising. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to speak really fast now. <laughs> okay. Um, because my previous study was 2013, I went back and had a quick look to see whether we still had the same type of material um, in music videos. And of course, we do. One thing I did notice though, there was less depictions of porn-inspired um, materials and costumes. However, I thought I'd go back and have a look at uh, some of the uh, highest rated um, music artist in the 2013 study and Miley Cyrus and Beyonce who were both the, the highest rated ones are still performing live. They're not actively um, doing concerts and making videos at the moment but they are still performing so they're still in the public eye and Katy Perry and Lady Gaga are creating new albums so I'm expecting that their work will be equally as sexual when it gets released. Uh, music regulations um, the reason that music cards can get away with all this sexualised presentation is because of the vagueness of the music regulations. Um, the music industry is governed by several media regulations due to its diverse means of broadcasting. And I'm going to flick through this really quickly. There is no formal classification system applicable for performing arts um, because it's under Section B, uh, Section 5B of the Classification Act exempt films and exempt computer games. So that means that music videos are not required to apply for classification. Uh, same with music DVDs, it's a voluntary labelling system, so they're, they're not required to um, classify their product. And um, music videos gets handballed. So ARIA um, says that it's uh, has to be classified by the Office of Film and Literature Classification Board and the Office of Film and Literature Classification Board says that it has to be classified by ARIA. So, n consequently, neither of them actually classify it. Internet regulations. Um, the internet has a duty to provide <coughs> systems to enable users to manage and access content and in relation to children, they, they rely quite heavily on adult supervision or parent supervision. Um, again, I want, I'm not going to go through this because I want to get to the end. Again, they have this, the same sort of vagueness in their language, no operational definitions. So there's likely to be considered <coughs> unsuitable, open to interpretation. 
Um, I'm just going to finish with, uh, media is a cultural influence in which children and young people learn. That has been highly evidenced through lots of research. The lack of media uh, regulations or rigorous media regulations means that children and young people are able to engage with adult material. The saturation of sexualised presentation in regulated media creates normality, therefore desensitising children to the sexualised content that they're exposed to on a daily basis. There's learning about this sexualised content. When you watch music videos, they look like soft pornography. This is desensitising children. When they're coming across soft pornography on the internet, they're probably not recognising the difference between a music video and the actual pornography. So whether through curiosity or by accident, children are starting to access pornography from earlier ages. They don't start off with hardcore porn, they're groomed into hardcore porn through soft porn. And soft porn, or depictions of soft porn, is saturated through our culture and through our media, our advertising, videos, programs, etc. The rise of technology um, gives children greater access to hardcore pornography far easier than what it was in the past, and it's very hard for parents to monitor. Like I said earlier, the fact that um, eight-year-olds commonly have their own uh, mobile phones, they can access this material without parents knowing. Kids' exposure to sexualised media is a precursor to engaging with porn. It's desensitising them to it to the degree that they um, may not recognise a difference, or it may give them a taste for wanting to see more of the sexualised presentation. Because as we know, children are uh, sexual beings. They're not, um, yeah. Um, and of course, it's a family and social responsibility. So one of the things that I uh, highly recommend um, in relation to parents and teachers and other people working with children is when you, children are exposed to this uh, sexualised media, please do report. A um, telephone call doesn't cut it. It has to be a written report. It has to go to the broadcasting um, body first. They're likely to uh, write back arguing against and justifying the reason why their sexualised content should be allowed to be shown in whatever means that they have identified. It's not until... Uh, that, that's when you go to ACMA, the Australian Communication and Media Authority. They will not act on anything until you've actually engaged with the broadcaster in, in the first instance. So thank you for listening and sorry I had to rush through everything.